Okay, so we'll get started. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, happy Sunday to all. Hope your weekend is going well. Um, I was just saying here, here on the East Coast, or at least where we are, it's uh, turned pretty cold, and uh, although it's going to get warm again soon, and then cold again and stuff. Um, so I hope your hope your weekend is going well wherever you are. And uh, I'm Hugh Byrne, and uh, I'm uh, a teacher with the Insight Meditation Community of Washington, which is the overall sponsor of these um, of these uh, classes, and uh, also sponsored by the Center for Mindful Living, which is part of IMCW. <clears throat> CML um, was a physical space, or was it's a community, but we had a, sp a physical space in Northwest DC uh, in Tenley Town for how long was it? 10, 12 years. Um, but then with the pandemic and paying rent and not using the facility, um, it didn't make sense to keep it anymore. So we're now a virtual community, but a very, very vibrant one. And you'll hear at the end more about some of the offerings of the Center for Mindful Living. Um, and the ways you can, you know, if you're not involved in other other activities outside of this class, you can do it because there's a lot of wonderful things happening that we'll share some about at the end. Um, so, uh, yeah, just a very, very warm welcome to everyone. Um, if you've been here many, many times, or if you've been here a few times, or if it's your first time here, um, just know um, you're, you're most welcome, whoever you are, you, to show up as who you are, you know, whatever, you know, gender, gen identification, any race, race, ethnicity, sexuality, sexual orientation, um, you know, physical, mental, you know, any, any, anything, um, you, the wonderful thing about I find about the teachings of the Dharma, the the Buddha's teachings, is that they're offered to everybody with a with an open open hand, and uh, and and my intention and our intention is that that everyone feel fully welcomed. That includes uh, in these these times. Um, uh, differences about beliefs because those can be held very tightly you know who what you know what do you believe what do you think about this what are your politics who do you vote for and it can be you know that can be something where you know people can feel very outside of it if they don't feel like they're in the you know in the main views of the of the group as a whole so i just want to make that very clear as well so welcome to everyone and uh it's always a joy to be together. Um, what? Just a little bit about the format. We uh, we begin with a, a meditation, typically about twenty minutes, and then uh, then there'll be a talk of uh, about half an hour, about thirty minute talk, mas o menos, and then um, we'll have. Uh, Emily will lead us in some mindful movement, which is always lovely to get into our into our bodies and very gentle and kind to ourselves. You know, nothing, no no pretzels involved in the making of this movie. Um, and then we'll um, we'll have some time for um, a, a shorter closing meditation. Some uh, maybe if there's time for some some questions and some sharing at the end and the way we're doing it now is that uh, we finish the class you know pretty promptly around 12 that's the intention and then um <clears throat> we will have afterwards either a breakout uh, groups for about 15 minutes or so um just sharing so some people not everybody but some people like to get together with a small group of you know three or four others um maybe in the and then the full the you know the remainder of the full group as well but that's kind of a little bit that's outside of the formal class you know because what we've found for a while was that you know the 
some people would like it and some wouldn't and you know you'd end up with half as many people as you started with and it's nice to maintain the cohesion of the the, the class and I, I find that's helpful as well in terms of supporting us so that's kind of a little on <clears throat> little bit on the on the format so we'll begin with a meditation and before I want to just do a short intro to the meditation. Um, it's um, something I've been reflecting on. This will just be a few minutes and then we'll get into the meditation. Um, one of the things um, that you've, everyone here, you know, who's been to a few meditation sessions, guided meditation sessions, will have heard, you know, it, beca it can become almost rope, you know. When the mind wanders, come back. <laughs> mind wanders, come back to the breath. Mind wanders, come back to the body. And it can become a little bit rote. And yet, and, and we can, in a way, lose the significance of that kind of noticing when we're off somewhere, when we're caught up in unconsciousness. You know, we're caught up in a strong emotion or we're lost in a story or a narrative. We're in the future, we're in the past, you know, we're, we're just somewhere else. We're not here. There's something very powerful about kind of realize, oh, I was off. Oh, I'm here again. And we're here again. And we consciously, and I, I think of it as, you know, a useful kind of metaphor is of making, making the shift. You know, of actually seeing it as a conscious shifting, you know, a choice where we're shifting back into awareness. Because so much of our suffering comes from unconsciousness, you know, of not being aware of our experience, not being away, aware of the way we're lost in our stories and often those stories uh, um, create suffering you know we think uh oh, this person doesn't like me or this you know the world is like this or i hate so and so you know all of this you know we get involved into these stories and we believe these stories and we you know we get to clinging to them and we suffer and 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 that's just one example there are many many ways that we can be in unconsciousness and there's something very powerful about moving from unconsciousness into awareness and because it's in awareness that the possibility of freedom comes because we can't we can't really find freedom when we're lost in the stories, lost in the strong emotions, swept up in something or other. We have to be able to come into awareness of that, find that they're happening, but now just notice that they're happening. Oh, I'm really angry. I notice the anger, notice the tension in my body, notice the stories in my mind noticing it rather than being swept up in it being oh this person they did this and how could they do this to me and they're such a this or that blah 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 you know the difference between that is the difference between ultimately is the difference between suffering and freedom so just to, to note that that is a very significant shift and and just invite that reflection on this kind of making the shift if it's a helpful metaphor just as Rumi's metaphor of the guest house might be a useful metaphor, but it might not be so useful to some. This might be a useful metaphor, just shifting into awareness. And when we're in awareness, then we're in that place we can make choices. And when we make choices, we can make choices that lead us towards freedom or choices that keep us locked up in suffering. You know, as Viktor Frankl, I often come back to the quote, you know, between the stimulus and the response is a space. In that space lies our ability to choose. And in our ability to choose lies our growth and our freedom. So being able to come into that space, and that's really the space of awareness, the space of mindfulness. So I just wanted to, to share that um, as a little bit of a, an intro to the, to the meditation today. And... Um, and then now to move, just to move into the, uh, the meditation, invite you to just find a comfortable posture, you know, taking your seat, 
Jack Cornfield often talks about taking your seat between heaven and earth. You know, think of the Buddha under the Bodhi tree. You know, a, a, a posture of, <coughs> excuse me, a posture of, of dignity. You know, just being here, being f as fully present as we can be in this moment. So, you know, just inviting the body to relax, the shoulders to relax. Let the chest be, be open so you can breathe in, breathe out. Maybe invite the, a relaxing of the chest and the belly. You might do a brief scan of your body, see if there's any area that could, you could relax a little bit more. So taking some moments to, to find your seat, take your seat. And our breathing can be a, you know, a wonderful support in our practice, as many of you will know well. And it can be helpful at the beginning of a meditation to take a few longer, deeper breaths. Just letting the breath help you settle into being here in, in your own time, in your own rhythm. Nice deep in breath and a long full out breath. As you breathe out, you might imagine yourself letting go of any holding, <clears throat> any stress or any worries. Just let them go with the breath. You might even invite a sense of peace as you breathe in, peace or ease or well-being. Breathing in, calming the body. Breathing out, calming the mind. If it's helpful, you might put a, put a hand on your belly, on your chest, just connecting with yourself, connecting with this life, this being that's you. The Buddha said you could travel all around the world and not find anyone more deserving of your love, love and caring than yourself. And not more than others, than for other people, not less. You are deserving of your kindness, your compassion, your care. <clears throat> And it may be a smile or a half smile might be helpful to just again relax a little bit more into being here. Sometimes it can be helpful to bring to mind a loved one. Just bring their image into your mind, into your heart. And then maybe that can help just soften any tightness, any tension, any strong emotions. In your own time, just letting the attention rest on your breathing. You know, not, not a controlled breathing, but just however the breath is right now. Breathing in and breathing out. Just being aware that you're breathing in and that you're breathing out. Mindfulness is really this knowing. 
we're here, we're sitting, we're breathing, and we know that we're here. We know that we're breathing in, we're breathing out. <clears throat> Just inviting the body and the mind to be, to be relaxed, to soften, to be here. And whatever comes up, whatever's present, just see if you can meet it with kindness and with acceptance. Peace is this moment without judgment. This moment in the heart space where everything that is, is welcome. Peace is this moment without judgment. This moment in the heart space where everything that is, is welcome. So letting your breathing be like a home base for you. So you can come back to, you can rest your attention on your breathing, come back to the mind, moves off into unawareness. Maybe for some, there may be a, some other focus that's more helpful than the breath, like the sounds around you or some feelings in your body or maybe an open awareness, whatever you might be using as a home base or as a, an anchor for your awareness. Just let the attention rest there. And there will be moments where you recognize, oh, I'm lost. I'm planning my meals for later today or going to meet with somebody or take a walk or my summer vacation or thinking about something that happened during the week. And that when we notice that, oh, I'm off in thought or caught up in a strong emotion, just appreciate that kind of waking up, that feeling of, oh, I'm here again. And consciously just making that shift, making the shift into just being here, maybe aware of your breathing or aware of the body. Let it be like a mini moment of awakening, waking up, because it is a waking up, waking up out of unconsciousness, out of the stories in our minds. 
and just coming back into this moment here now. And each time we come back, we're training the mind. You might say retraining the mind. You know, in the language of neuroscience, we're creating or strengthening neural pathways, pathways in the brain, so that they become the you know, the main highways for us or the main places where we rest in our attention rather than spending, you know, a whole lot of our time in in our heads or in our stories, in our narratives. So this coming back is a training of the mind. It's not a, a glitch or a fault or a failing there's something to notice and then choosing to come back, choosing to be here. You know, knowing that that being here as fully as we can for some period of time actually is a helpful thing in our lives, and beneficial for us. Kind of remembering that. The Pali word for mindfulness, where the word we get mindfulness from in English from is sati, S-A-T-I. And sati, the, the origin of the word is in remembering. So we're kind of training our minds to remember. Remember to be here. Remember why it's important and valuable. Share Lynn Unger's poem, The Way It Is. One morning you might wake up to realize that the knot in your stomach had loosened itself and slipped away. 
and that the pit of unfilled longing in your heart had gradually, and without your really noticing, been filled in, patched like a pothole, not quite the same as it was, but good enough. And in that moment, it might occur to you that your life, though not the way you planned it, and maybe not even entirely the way you wanted it, is nonetheless persistently, abundantly, miraculously, exactly what it is. As we finish off this meditation, you might, just as you breathe in, just wish yourself well. Maybe appreciating yourself for taking this time to practice, to come together in community. Just wishing yourself on well on an in-breath. May I be happy, may I be safe, whatever, whatever expression for you feels most real, most helpful. And as you breathe out, you might breathe out kindness and care to all of us here, everyone here. And the Buddha said all of spiritual practice is community, is Sangha. We wake up together, we support each other. So appreciating everyone here. Breathing in, wishing yourself well. Breathing out, sending kindness, care, compassion out to everyone here and outward into the world. You know, the terrible losses in human life in, in Turkey and in Syria from the earthquake. I can't even, don't even know the latest uh, numbers. I think it was... 38,000 killed and just holding those who've died and those who survived in our hearts and in our prayers and in our meditation and all who are suffering just wishing everyone well may you be free from suffering May all beings be happy and safe, free from suffering. We finish with this uh, poem. <clears throat> it uh, has many translations and different names, but one of the names is uh, The Mind of Absolute Trust, and it's by Seng San, who's from the Chinese Zen master from the 6th century of the current era. The Great Way isn't difficult for those who are unattached to their preferences. Let go of longing and aversion and everything will be perfectly clear. When you make a hair's breadth distinction, heaven and earth are set apart. If you want to realize the truth, don't be for or against. The struggle between good and evil 
is the primal disease of the mind. Many, many more chapters and verses or verses of this, um, but I'll leave it there. So take your time coming back into <clears throat> into the group and seeing the faces on the screen screens and uh, lovely people in our different parts of the of the country and of the continent maybe maybe one or two outside as well in Europe. Uh, um, North Africa, wherever. So welcome to, welcome everyone who's uh, joined us after you know, the start. Morning, Brian, good to, good to see you, have you with us from, I guess still from Los Angeles, where I lived for almost a decade. Um, so again, welcome everyone. We're gonna. Um, I'm gonna move into the the talk now, and uh, what I've been doing, and this kind of, I'm gonna do a little review at the beginning because not everyone is able to be present every every time, um, and it's also sometimes helpful just to have a recap of uh, of some of the main points that are that have been made. <clears throat> But overall, for the last five or so sessions, I've been talking about what I'm terming like two, two paths. You know, we could talk about it as paths or goals. Paths are more about the practices that we do, and goals are more about the outcome or the ending that we're wanting to see. And, you know, not to make it a problem, sometimes in Buddhism, Goals are like, oh, don't talk about goals, you know, <laughs> too much, you know, too much looking into the future. But there's nothing wrong with goals. It's the problem, as always, is is only with the clinging. You know, it's not, you know, wanting a nice meal isn't a problem, but clinging to it's got to be the way I want it to be is where the problem is. So just to, to make a note of that, that's my view, at least. Um, uh, Sherry says, can you share both poems that you read? Um, one is Seng San, um, The Mind of Absolute Trust, and the other was um, uh, Lin Unger, The Way It Is, The Way It Is. So um, we we'll maybe put that in the chat box later. Um, so the part, so I've been talking about the, uh, the paths of, of um, of wellness and awakening. And I just share some of the main things I've, I've been saying that, you know, we can distinguish these paths, you know, these, if you like, either goals or paths, depending, as I say, on the practice or on the, we're focused on the practice or on the outcome. But the goal of the path of wellness is, is really everyday well being, less stress, less anxiety, distress in our lives, um, more well-being, everyday well-being, able to kind of be in the world in a relatively happy way. You know, Freud a hundred years ago spoke about it as the kind of the absence of misery, you know, moving from misery to suffering, everyday suffering, you know. So um, that's one framing of it. Um, and the goal of, of awakening really focuses both on you know, letting go of what we need to let go of, letting go of stress and worry and anxiety and all the things we might be clinging to, you know, ways of being with our experience that aren't skillful. But it goes much further than that as well. So abandoning what's painful, but also, you know, cultivating heart qualities, mind qualities that are, that are ennobling, that are beneficial, you know, joy, peace, happiness genuine happiness and ultimately letting go of 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 all clinging you know the buddha talked about about the his path 
as the goal of the path as the end of suffering, you know, the end of suffering. You know, I think I used the image, maybe I did, of, of, you know, a tree, you know, if you want to, you know, get rid of a tree completely, you know, you, you cut it down. And the Buddha talked about this in his, his talks. He, say, he was talking about his own letting go, his own, you know, ending clinging in his own life. And talked about, you know, imagine you cut down a tree and you pulled up all of the roots and then you burned everything. So it's everything is just ash. And then you threw the ashes out to the wind and the wind took them in every different direction. You know, the Buddha asked, could you, could that tree re, be reconstituted as a tree? And, you know, his followers would say, uh, no. And, and in the same way, the clinging that had been there before didn't have any hold. It couldn't be reconstituted. This is the nature of, you know, what the Buddha is talking about as, as awakening. So again, the path of wellness is, you know, we can associate with psychotherapy. We can, uh, uh, yeah, and secular secular mindfulness, um, mindfulness based stress reduction, mindfulness based cognitive ter therapy, mindfulness based relapse prevention, all the kind of offshoots of MBSR. Um, you know, where the goal isn't complete awakening, it's much more stress reduction, and it's great. You know, it's it's. You know, I've taught MBSR for 10 years and, and, and I think it's a wonderful program. Um, but just to make that distinction, they're very different, different goals, definitely, and, and somewhat, you know, different in their paths as well. Even the Buddha, even the Buddha's teachings um, that were directed towards householders as opposed to the monastic community were focused not on typically were not focused on deep states of, a, of, of meditation, of getting into deep absorptions or understanding the 12 limbs of dependent origination. You know, that wouldn't have been like people who are farming and selling their goods in the marketplace. You know, they're not really, that, that's not what they're focused on. They're focused on bringing up their families and doing, and the Buddha obviously understood that. And so the teachings were, were directed towards, you know, where people were at, you know, and what their capacity and what their goals were, etc. And so the focus of his teachings to householders was basically to live ethically, to live ethically, to live generously and kindly, you know, do the right thing for your family and in your work and don't be dishonest and all these things, but, but not so much focused on, you know, the, the, the end of suffering, not I don't mean that in an absolute way, because all of the teachings are about awakening. You know, I shared the <coughs> the Buddha's well-known, <coughs> excuse me, well-known um, quote where he said, "All of his, um, just as the um, just as the ocean has one taste, you know, the taste of salt, so my teachings, my teachings and discipline has one taste." the taste of freedom. So even, even though his teach, you know, whoever he was teaching to, it was, it, the teachings have, had, have one, t one taste. Um, so, so that, so, you know, the, the, the path of wellness, kind of everyday well-being, the path of awakening about ending suffering completely in this life. And talking about, when we talk about awakening, and one of the things I'm trying to do in these talks is to not make awakening or make awakening and enlightenment and those things, not as some kind of glitzy thing up on the top of a mountain that only one in 10 million people can access or realize, but rather something all of us have the capacity to realize. And, you know, as Arjun Chah says, you know, let go a little and you'll have a little peace. Let go a lot and you'll have a lot of peace. Let go completely and you'll experience complete peace, complete happiness. Your struggle with the world will be at an end. And that we can see there is a possibility of, of, of you know, small awakenings, you know, small, you know, but nonetheless very, very, very real and very important and, and potentially very transformational. So it's not like an all or nothing thing, you know, 
awakening. Even in the classical Buddhist teachings, there's talked about four stages of awakening where different fetters, you know, are abandoned. I won't go into the details of that today, but you know, it's not a, it's not a one-time all or nothing, you know, thing. You know, uh, not even a thing anyway. But um, you know, or even an experience. You know, it's kind of more ineffable than that. But but just that it, that it is realizable, and what it involves is a really a radical transformation of our consciousness and our being. We're in the world in a different way different way of being and a different way of seeing i don't know if you know if 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 any of you or many of you have had experiences where some you know you've had a really a quite a, a deep insight that has l allowed you to let go in some very important way you know it could be something to do with the heart you know letting go of holding on to something um it could be, you know, it could be just, you know, a, a way of understanding things and letting go of clinging in some way. You know, it could be a movement from addiction to recovery. For some, that can be a very powerful kind of opening of just seeing, yeah, I, that's a path I don't want to go down anymore. And I want to go down, you know, a more skillful and more helpful and more wholesome path. You know, um, I think the more we have kind of some some glimmering, some glimpses, some insights, the more we can kind of get what the Buddha is pointing to in the big, in the larger kind of scheme of a, uh, of awakening. But, you know, I, I gave the example. I'm not this example. The story um, of the Buddha after his awakening being asked by people who saw him, you know, just having this kind of radiance about him. Um, and kind of wow, who is that? <laughs> you know, uh, you know, like you might you might have experienced people. You know, for some it might be the Dalai Lama, who just kind of a presence. You know, it comes from five hours of meditating every day for seventy, eighty years, and you know, letting go of you know hatred and you know revenge or any of these things. You know, that that there's something that. You know becomes embodied in that you know it just shine it can can really just shine through so they would ask him you know are you a god and he said no and they say well are you a, you know in it reincarnation of a god no and they're kind of puzzled and are you a, are you are you a man he said no and then what are you then and he says i am awake I am awake. And the Buddha, from the time of his enlightenment, his awakening under the tree in Bodh Gaya, northern India, 25, 2600 years ago, was always known as the Buddha, the awakened one. He was known by the quality of awakening rather than by George, Sidney, Susan, whatever, Siddhartha in his case, known by the awakening, by that quality, that transcendent quality of awakening um uh, and it is called the awakened one and, and as you may know the word for buddha is the same word that we have for bud not bud 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 you know a flower budding like you look at sam's flowers or Anne's flowers um you know budding and that's that that's the awakening you know they're opening up you know opening up to I think of it as opening up to our true potential as as human beings in this human life, you know that we have this capacity to waken up. I find it wake up. I find it really inspiring and hopeful, even in the midst of all the challenges and you know the ups and downs and the one step forward, one step back that sometimes it can feel like. So I talked about these two paths and, and kind of said, in, you know, in, in one way, they can be seen as very distinct from each other, you know, different goals, different ends, some different practices involved in them, you know, in what we do for wellness and compared, you know, com contrasted maybe with what we do for path of enlightenment. But they, they can also be seen as on a continuum, you know, that uh, that some of the practices really are you know we could think of practices of being well and letting go of stress and abandoning anxiety and all of that as really very much on the path to awakening as well we have to do that 
and I shared the quote from um, from Ram Das, um, which I like a lot. It's kind of his inimitable humor. He says, "Once you become somebody, then you're ready to start your journey to become nobody." <laughs> once you once you once you once you become somebody then you're ready to start your journey to become nobody which i like it's got it's kind of cute and funny but it's also got the kind of i think an, a, a kernel of you know essence of truth in it because i i do think we need to do the work you know often it could be the work of therapy or the work of dealing with our traumas or dealing with just dealing with our everyday stresses and anxieties you know maybe through mindfulness-based stress reduction that those can very much be necessary but not sufficient conditions for awakening you know if we don't do that work then we will tend to meet barriers on the way that can be very painful, very difficult, you know, we'll get swept up, you know. I know some of that from very much from my own experience, how that, you know, we can get really caught up in stress and anxiety and, and uh, you know, we hopefully we use our, our, our um, time away to uh, see what we haven't been looking at uh, closely enough. So, so seeing this, uh, you know, seeing it as a, you know, this these paths really as potentially also seeing them as a as a continuum. Um, and I also shared the metaphor of a spiral, which is I find a really helpful one. That we're kind of that we go round and round, and we keep having to deal with the same or very similar things over and over. Any of you find this in your life? That, you know, it may be a different person, it may be a different kind of situation, but it's kind of like, haven't I been here before? <laughs> you know, haven't I, haven't I, haven't I seen this before? What's going on? It just keeps going round and round. And there's two, two great quotes that I love. One is from Minga Rinpoche, and some of you know, know this one. He says, ultimately, your happiness depends on choosing between the discomfort of being aware of your mental afflictions and the discomfort of being ruled by them. So either way, there's discomfort, but there's the discomfort of being, you know, the, of awareness that can lead to letting go, to freedom. And there's the discom discomfort of just wash, rinse, repeat. We do things over and over again and we're, we stay in that cycle. You know, so that that that's one, and the other. For him, saying very much the same thing is from the Thai great Thai teacher Arjun Chah, who says there's two kinds of suffering. There's a suffering that leads to more suffering, and there's a suffering that leads to the end of suffering. And this and the suffering that leads to more suffering is, you know, that addictions are good. Not just a metaphor, but a good you know, similarly good, good example of where we think getting the thing we want is going to make us happy, but it's actually only tying us more and more tightly to the wheel of addiction or the wheel of suffering. And it's not just addiction, but in many, many other ways we can be, we can be caught up. And that's the suffering that leads to more suffering. We think that the thing we clinging to, getting it is it will make us happy, but it actually only increases the clinging because we haven't, dealt with what's underneath the clinging you know we haven't been willing to be with our experience that is actually moving us to escape into the drug or the person or the thing or the thing that's going to make us happy or we think will make us happy the other kind of suffering is when we are willing to stay with our experience and through staying with our experience we can find you know, we can we can find a way of letting go. We can end that cycle. We can see it clearly, let go, and then it doesn't have to keep coming round again. It may keep visiting us, but then we just keep seeing it and say, "Oh, I see you. I don't need to go there again." That isn't a path that leads to needs, leads to happiness and well being. So, you know, if we do if we do work with what is not conscious. And we bring it into consciousness, like um, 
Carl Jung said, you know, what is not brought to consciousness comes to us as fate. You know, if we keep, you know, staying in that pattern of, that, of unawareness, then it'll just keep going and it'll, it'll be acted out as fate. You know, we'll do things that we regret doing because we don't really realize why we keep doing them because we haven't brought them into awareness. So um, we have to bring them into awareness. And if we do, then it becomes a kind of virtuous spiral where it can be a spiral towards greater and greater freedom. So that's, I find that a very helpful metaphor. And I think I'm going to come back and kind of explore this more later as well. Not today, but probably in, in, in future talks, because it has a lot in common with the Buddhist understanding of karma. You know, because that's really what karma is, that we keep, you know, we keep repeating things. Things keep see where we're holding and let go and then, and then find freedom. So I think the last time we, we talked about, we'd moved into awakening and kind of looking at what, what really characterizes awakening. And, um, you know, some of the things I was saying today of, um, you know, the Buddha, you know, this sense of this, this real transformation of our way of being in the world and the way of seeing the world. It's not just an everyday, you know, mental understanding it's not just a oh yeah i get this it's a it's a deep a deep understanding that actually transforms our life that's that's re really what a awakening is about and i talked about that last time and um you know you talked about the the uh, the translation of of or the ori or original meaning of the word for awakening nibbana in pali or nirvana in in Sanskrit is, um, is, is blowing out, like blowing out a, a candle. And it's about, it's really blowing out the, the fire of clinging, if you like, the fire of clinging. And the Buddha I mentioned last time has, has a, um, a, a talk, a discourse that's normally spoke has been spoken about in english as the fire sermon it's a wonderful wonderful talk on everything is burning he says you know the 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 eyes are burning the ears are burning everything's burning burning with what burning with clinging so without awareness you know we're, we're burning up with clinging we're wanting things we don't like we're hating things we don't like you know we're pushing them away we're spacing out from things we don't want to deal with you know all of this is is the fire of clinging and but the buddhist teachings really about awakening is putting out the fire quenching the fire you know blowing out the candle and so what I want to do in to, a little bit today and in the coming session, session, maybe sessions, is talk about what, what are the key elements of awakening? Um, uh, um, no, firstly, talk about what is the path of awakening? What are the key practices and trainings that lead to the end of suffering? And I really want to do this today and just naming them, you know, just kind of giving a I know, taxonomy or a kind of a, these are what I see as kind of five of the main teachings that very, very focused, very, very much are focused on awakening. Um, you know, m very much in just naming it because it would take m multiple sessions to talk about those in depth. And we will do in other ways in, in the coming year. But um, so that, that question, what, what's the path of awakening? What, and what's the, another question, what is the key element of awakening or key, mm -hmm. key element to awakening? And just uh, a, a, a um, what's the word? I'm, a clue. <laughs> a clue is uh, more than a clue is the answer is insight. Insight is the critical element and i'll come I'll, I'll talk about that i probably won't talk much about it today for time but next time um so what is the key element to awakening and how does it how does insight lead to awakening what's the kind of what's the trajectory that will lead there i'll talk, talk about these different 
main different practices and how exactly do we walk that path to awakening i want to talk again this will probably be next time about um, the question of whether awakening is something that happens suddenly and all at once or is it something that happens gradually or both is it both sudden some combination of sudden and gradual and then at the end well again you know in the next talk or two we'll conclude with a discussion of the metaphor of uh, of the spiral so just maybe touching on the couple of the two main points today to finish up what is the path of of awakening and what are the key practices what are the key practices you know one of the things that the people practitioners students of the Buddha's teachings can find difficult is um, there's so many lists you know there's the five this and the eight this is and the four this is and the three that's and you know and for some people this is like oh give me a break you know that my mind doesn't think in terms of lists of things apart from our shopping you know um but um that was kind of that was thinking back 2500 years i mean you had to remember things you know the buddha's buddha's teachings were weren't written down until 500 years after he died you know up till then it was an oral transmission and so people had to really learn these teachings they had to have memories probably a lot better than ours today in order to kind of and certainly to pass on the teachings and so you know the monks and nuns would recite them and chant them and it's through chanting them that they came down through you know the generations until they were written down in the pali language known now as the pali canon or the authoritative teachings of the dharma in the pali language for the theravadan tradition um that um that they had to be they had to be remembered so that's why you have all of these lists but I actually find them quite helpful, just kind of like they become like coat hangers for like, OK, there's this batch and there's that batch and there's this batch. And, and I find it helpful just for my own brain to have those, you know, you know, to be able to say the Noble Eightfold Path is. And I just want to name them now um, to kind of give you a sense of what are the key, key, I think are the key teachings. You can say all of the Buddha's teachings relate to, to awakening, and they do, because they're not really meaningful teachings of the Buddha unless they, unless they point to awakening, unless they point to freedom. But these teachings that I'm going to mention, I think, are particularly connected. You know, some of them are ones we know well. You know, the first is the obvious one, is the Four Noble Truths. I'm not, you know... The existence of suffering, the origin of suffering in clinging, the end of suffering, nirvana, nibbana, freedom, and the path to the end of suffering, the eightfold path. So simple way of thinking about the Four Noble Truths is if we cling, we suffer. If we let go of clinging, we let go of suffering. Just very simple, just that that's just my own kind of encapsulation of the Four Noble Truths. You know, clinging leads to suffering, letting go of clinging leads to ending suffering. So the Four Noble Truths are at the heart really of everything. They're the kind of understanding of suffering and the end of suffering. The Eightfold Path really is the, it are the practices that lead to the end of suffering, the training. And they're, they're a training in meditation, training the mind in ethics, living wisely, living kindly, living compassionately, and in wisdom, cultivating wisdom. So, you know, the wisdom component is wise understanding and wise intention. The ethical component is wise speech, wise action, wise livelihood. And the mental training, meditation component is wise effort wise mindfulness and wise concentration. Again, list lists, sh lists, um, but, but just again, just to give that kind of 
kind of a little bit of of, of the map you know that the that the that the eightfold path the fourth of the note four noble truths is the um is the path of practice it gets down to kind of the nitty gritty of how we go towards awakening from where we are right now wherever we are right now towards greater freedom and then the next kind of category if you like is that within that eightfold path one element is particularly they're all important and it's not a hierarchy of importance but mindfulness plays a very critical role so we pull mindfulness out of the eight it's number seven typically in the list we pull mindfulness out as what the buddha talked about the direct path to liberation goes comes through mindfulness any moment of our lives we can just pause and say what am i aware of right now and can I be present with this moment as it is, just as we did in meditation, but we can do any moment of our lives, we can just come back. What am I aware of? Can I be with this moment just as it is? And what happens and what do I see when I open to this moment wholeheartedly, when I bring radical acceptance to my experience here and now? What, what happens? Well, one of the things that happens is we start seeing things more clearly. One of the things we can come to see is that my subjective experience right now, when I see this, I can see some of the deeper characteristics of all of life, not just my own experience. We can come to see what's true of every experience, other people's experiences, this experience of life itself. So mindfulness is the path to insight and it's the insight that frees us. And that's what I'm gonna talk about more next week, that how seeing clearly, I'm gonna talk about that kind of nexus of mindfulness leading to insight and insight, and it's the insight that frees us as the wonderful teacher, Rob Babea, who died three almost three years ago in his book his book is called seeing that freeze seeing that freeze which is i think a wonderful title that he some people kind of said to him why do you call your book seeing that freeze it's like it sounded like anti-freeze or something you know freeze like being cold but it really captures it it is the seeing that frees us it's seeing clearly that allows us to let go you can see the seeing clearly is like realizing that you're holding a hot piece of coal and and abandoning it letting it go that's the nature of of insight it's like ha ah, awakening and and that's this kind of how awakening can be sudden my own view on the sudden and gradual is that it's really both you know different people may have different views of it but we ha we do or can not necessarily do but we can have real deep insights and letting go that helps us, really transforms us and helps us lead our life in more wise and skillful ways, really transforms us. But we still have work to do. And the other kind of way of looking at the path is of a gradual path of step by step. Sometimes practicing, as some of you here have for 20, 30 plus years, but not necessarily, uh, may not even be a lot of these kind of light bulb going on moments but you notice something in your life you know you feel less stressed you feel more engaged in your work you feel more loving to your partner or spouse or children or whatever you know it's like changes it's like that Lynn Unger poem you know of realizing that something has shifted you know so anyway that's a that's that's a, that that other question but so mindfulness as as a, as a really a key element on this you know, on direct path to liberation. And I'll name, I'll name three other main kind of area, areas of practice or groups of teachings. One is the five hindrances, you know, because they're the obstacles. You can, you can think of the five hindrances as obstacles to awakening. So just to name them again, it's the wanting mind, 
you know, craving, wanting, clinging, that, that kind of mind that's in that wanting mode first. Secondly, it's aversion. That's the wanting to get rid of mind, push away mind. We're caught up. I hate that person. They're terrible. This politician, this family member, whatever, that aversion. The others, sloth and torpor, you know, that kind of lethargy, you know, you can't, you like walking through molasses and it just doesn't feel, you don't like it. The not liking it is the quality that's important, that it's like lethargy, tiredness, kind of mind and body not feeling active um, and it, and not liking that you're, that it's this way. So sloth and torpor, the fourth one being restless and restlessness and worry, that's being agitated, or being worried, being restless, being worried, oh, what's going to happen? And the mind caught up in that. That's a distressing state. It's an obstacle that we need to work with. And the final one is it can be a very powerful and difficult one, and that's doubt. You know, not 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 having confidence in ourselves or in the teacher, cheap teacher or in the teachings, you know, and, and that can be a real obstacle. It's good to have skeptical skepticism, but not of a doubt, a doubt that's a kind of cynicism or, or, you know, you fundamentally don't believe anything. In the Zen, they say there's the great doubt, you know, which is like, I don't know anything, but that can be very wholesome. But this is a kind of a debilitating doubt. So these hindrances are obstacles. So that's another group. And then the opposite, what sometimes are called the anti-hindrances, are the seven awakening factors. These are mindful, and again, just naming mindfulness, leading to investigation, interest, curiosity, which then leads to energy. We get inspired, energetic which then leads to joy because the mind is open and we feel joyful. When joy, fourth quality, when joy kind of tamps down, it becomes tranquility, a sense of ease and calm. And when the mind is, that's the fifth, and then when the mind is calm, then um, it becomes more concentrated, more easily focused, more easily concentrated. And then that's the sixth concentration. And then when the mind is concentrated, we're much more able to deal with the ups and downs of life. And that leads with ups and downs of life, ups and downs of practice. And that leads to equanimity, the seventh of these qualities. So these awakening factors. So again, I'm just naming these as kind of the a roadmap, I think, on the path to awakening, some of the very, very central teachings of the Buddha and of the Dharma. And then the final ones being the the ones we you know we talk quite a lot about, and that is the uh, the Brahma Viharas, the four beautiful qualities, the divine abodes, qualities of loving kindness, compassion, spiritual joy or appreciative joy and equanimity. So just kind of I wish I had the white board, but we're trying to work out the <laughs> the glitches of, and maybe I just need to update my uh, Zoom settings. But I want to, I think what I'm going to do for my Insight Timer class is to um, is to do a write up of this. So I'll I'll share that in the uh, Center for Mindful Living uh, group as well. So just to make it kind of relatively straightforward because it can seem like I don't, I'm not trying to do all of these teachings but I'm just wanting to name them because I think it can be helpful to have kind of have that that road map um, so I'm just going to kind of move towards closure here um, and just set, again re reiterate again that kind of what I want to continue to do is just kind of look at okay so if we have this as a you know, if we have a sense of what awakening is, and we have a kind of a broad roadmap of what are the key teachings that are taking us down that path to greater, you know, towards awakening, what specifically leads to awakening? You know, what is it that, <clears throat> that really leads to um, freeing the heart? And what I'm going to say is that, you know, the key pieces really are mindfulness, the practice of mindfulness leading to insight and that insight um, 
really creating the conditions for freeing ourselves and really transforming our lives um, completely. So next time what I want to do is um, uh, talk about that, maybe talk a little bit more about this sudden gradual and how this happens within the larger kind of framework of our life, our life and then come back at the end to um, the metaphor of the um, of the spiral, which I find a useful one, um, kind of bringing together both the, the wellness part and the awakening part and kind of bringing together Jung and the Buddha and, 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 and other things as well. So I hope that hasn't been TMI. I know it is a lot and was a lot, and particularly the stuff around the roadmap, but but I, I, hopefully that'll be helpful. And if I do it in a, a kind of a type it up way, um, I hope that, that that will be useful. So maybe just to finish up, we might just uh, take three three breaths. So before we move into the transition to, to Emily and the mindful movement, just three long, full, deep breaths in breaths and out breaths. So thank you. Thank you for your kind attention. And I hope that something was helpful in that. And anything that isn't, just leave it on, on your seat. And handing it over now to Emily. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. Thank you so much, Hugh. And let me invite you to mindful movement, just as Hugh spoke. And just sway your arms. You can be gentle. If you feel more energetic, that's good. Energy is good in mindfulness. It's one of the factors of awakening that we persist. Our perseverance is important. And then open up wide, expanding your arms, your body. Lift your hands up, and we're going into tapping, just tapping on the top of our heads. Our heads that hold so much energy, good energy. The mind is an important part of our awakening. And then bring your hands down along the sides of your head. Down to your jaw, across the jaw, just tapping, enjoying the sensation. Then down along the sides of your neck, down to your heart, your chest. Tapping, you could slap, more energetic, bump. Just being here in this moment, embodied with so many thoughts that have come into our Sangha this way. And now take your right hand and cross over, tapping your left shoulder down along the arm. Creating a response, the energetic response to your tapping being mindful, back up, up to your left shoulder, cross to your chest, take a moment there, and then over, tapping the right shoulder along the arm, underneath, back up, good, tapping that left, Right shoulder, one more time, both the chest, drop your hands down, feel the energy within your body, the connection with mindfulness, the body, 
your circulation tingling. And then lift your arms up, grasping your left wrist in your right hand. Extend out towards the right, lengthening the side of your body, opening up the left rib cage with an inhale. Exhale, soften your shoulders. And now lift up, switch over to the left side, lengthening the right side. Inhaling, exhale, soften. See where less effort, less tension brings you. Just more mindfulness. Inhale, up. Float your arms down, roll your shoulders. You could move around with your feet as I am. Roll them the other way. Bring your, come back to center. Bring your arms up into cactus arms. Drop your hands down, keeping the elbows up. Inhale, rise. Dropping down. Inhale, rise up, extend your arms out. Take a look at your left palm. And on the inhale, switch to the right. Back to the left, back to the right. Drop your arms down, roll your shoulders independently. And roll them the other way, enjoying the sensation. Now come to center. I'm going to turn sideways to demonstrate a flat back. Just feel where your legs join your hips, the hip crease, and extend your spine away from your hips. Not moving into the low back this way, just pressing on your feet, feeling the energy rise. And now if you'd like to drop your head down. Your shoulders, keeping that hip crease conscious, placing your hands above your knees, breathing in, breathing out. I invite you to drop down as where it's comfortable, where it's comfortable for you. You can soften your knees, just breathing, taking a deep breath in. Exhale with a sigh. <sighs> Draw your hands back to above your knees. And then tuck your tailbone under. Start rising up your spine. Lift your arms up to reach up. And then drop them down. And we'll go into our last move. Arms at the sides of your bodies, lifting up. Place your hands above your head. Draw your hands to heart center. Turn them out to the group, wishing our group well. Down to the earth, wishing the earth well. And then on an inhale, lift your arms up, up above your head, palms together, down above your head, feeling that center line down to your heart. And take a bow. Thank you for your practice. Thank you, Emily. Lovely as always. Deeply appreciated. Thank you. So um, I'm looking at the time, and so I think what we'll do is uh, maybe just following the uh, the movement, we'll just have a very short meditation, and then we'll have some announcements. So um, let's just uh, take a couple of minutes to let the attention come inward again. And invite a, a quality of kindness and acceptance towards 
your experience just as it is right now. Meeting whatever is here with kindness, with acceptance, with interest. You might just notice what, if anything, has changed since we began this morning. You know, perhaps the heart might feel more open, or who knows, it might feel more closed. You know, it might be anything can can happen, you know, all sorts of causes and conditions. So our practice is just to hold whatever is here, meet whatever is here with kindness and with with acceptance, you know, with, with as deep rooted an acceptance as we can. And if there's resistance to doing that or it's resistance to our experience, to see if we can meet the resistance with kindness and with acceptance. Be taking a moment to appreciate your own effort today, coming here, paying attention, practicing, and appreciating everyone else who's here, all of the other members of the community, you know, waking up together. And this from Li Po, the birds have vanished into the sky and now the last cloud drains away. We sit together, the mountain and me, until only the mountain remains. We sit together, the mountain and me, until only the mountain remains. Again, coming back into the group, I'm just going to, before handing it over to Deb today, um, I'm going to um, just mention a couple of things. Uh, my only main um, announcement is for those who, um, who don't already know, because I've put out word through IMCW and through CML, I have a course beginning on Tuesday on the Buddha's central teaching of mindfulness that I've talked briefly about today, the, um, the Satipatthana Sutta, the Foundations of Mindfulness. And it's, uh, it's, it's been called the most important teaching in the entire Pali Canon, the entire teaching of written teaching of the Buddha. Um, and uh, it, it really relates to mindfulness in every aspect of our lives. So we've got a six week class beginning Tuesday evening. Um, I'll uh, hopefully will share a um, uh, a link to that uh, to that to that class, um, and if, let me know if you have any any questions about it. And then um, just to mention that we uh, there's no uh, cost or no charge to come to the class. It's uh, offered on what is called a dana or generosity basis, and which is how the teachings have come down to us through twenty five hundred years. And um, a, a, a practice, a tradition we're very committed to keeping going. So thank you for your support. Um, there are links giving ways that you can make donations if you choose to do so. And uh, just to thank um, to thank Emily as always, to thank Deb and Heather, thank everyone, thank Michelle and Dan for their work and everybody um, and uh, as part of this um, community as a politician once says it takes a village 